Welcome back. 755 is real. We're all, we're here. We're late. I'm David O'Brien, Braves writer for The Athletic. I'm with my co-host. We're going to do it really fast since we're late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with my co-host, Eric O'Flaherty, former Braves reliever. What's up, Eric? What's going on, Dave? Not much, man. Sorry, everybody. Uh, Cam told us we were doing it at 115, and then, then I see that it says one on the thing. So I blame the producer entirely for that one because yeah. it usually is his fault, and it is his fault on this one. Um, off the top. Uh, the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you guys check out our sponsors in the description below. Also, uh, rem- oh, tune in. We're going to do another one of those live rooms on Wednesday. We'll post the time for that, but we're going to do that Wednesday. Cam, do we have a time yet for that? No, we need to decide on it. What time? I mean, we can discuss it after the show, but I just want to let people know probably, that yeah. Wednesday, 100%, we'll right. be doing a live room. So make sure to tune into that. All right. So we'll probably do it at noon. Which means can't well can will probably say noon and we'll start at twelve fifteen. So, but be looking around noon. That's when we'll do it. We'll Unbelievable! That. All right. Unbelievable! Don't chime in now, Cam. You messed this up. So we're gonna just go ahead on without soldier on without without your help. Um. <laughs> hey, listen, Eric, man, the Braves are not off to the kind of start that they had hoped for. Obviously, uh, they're not panicking. I know a lot of the fans are because the Mets are pretty damn good this year. But I, I. F- f- before we get into what's gone wrong, two things that are, are obviously uh, either encouraging or very hopeful of what's coming up. Ronald Acuna might be back as soon as next week. It looks like it's going to happen next week. I wouldn't I wouldn't think it's going to be for the Rangers series this weekend, but I do think he will be activated for that Mets series that starts Monday up in New York, four games in three days. Um, they're having him play. He's going to take a day off tomorrow. They have an early game at Gwinnett at Tuesday. Uh, one of those weird starts they have that's 11 in the morning. Yeah. They are wisely not going to have him get up and try to play no. at 11 in the morning. <laughs> so, But he's going to play uh, Wednesday night, seven innings, and then Thursday night, nine innings, at back-to-back in the outfield. And I know the plan was to have him work up to consecutive games and then three straight games in the outfield. So to me, that tells me they're going to – unless they just scrap that, Tells me they're aiming for next uh, for the for the series in New York on Monday. But the point is, it's coming back a couple of three weeks earlier than they had anticipated. You know, initially they said maybe he'll be back early May for to DH and late May to uh, play in the outfield. But it's going to be all come back to play full bore in the outfield because that's what he's doing down there, playing mostly in the outfield. He's DH a couple of times. He's looked good. He's actually playing. He's a little more active than Snit thought maybe they had they had hoped he would be with the stealing bases and scoring yeah. from second and all that. They probably wish he tempered a little bit, but they also know you can't really tell the guy to go at 80%, you know, because that's he'll end up getting hurt if they do that. Yeah, and I mean, if, it's, if he's going to do that when he gets up anyway, you know, it's kind of good to get that out of the way, even if he, you know, and maybe he even did it without really being asked to or authorized to. And he just, he's yeah, playing he's the way playing. he plays, yeah. you know. And so once he does those things, you might cringe a little bit and be like, shit, we wish he wasn't doing that yet. But he does it. And it's kind of like he just passes the test early. Yeah. And the purpose of having him play as many games as he's playing down there is to build stamina because while right. he's able to do this, Nobody thought he wouldn't be able to sprint. You know, he's been doing that. He's been working on his legs now for, for you know, eight months. I mean, he's going to be strong. Uh, they want him to build stamina, which you're only going to do by being out in the field. People don't understand what it takes to, to play the outfield for three hours, you know. Oh, yeah. You're standing around. You're jump, going back and forth, especially, you know, if he has to play center. But, um, you know, he's likely he's more likely to get hurt if he's worn out, if he's not used to playing out there and then tries to do some of those moves, you know, whether it's in the outfield or, or scoring from second and all that. Uh, so they want him to build up stamina. They're just trying to do everything they can to prevent a re-injury. You, you can't do everything, obviously, without putting him in bubble wrap and telling him to never run hard and all that, which you're not going to do. But they can be take the doctor's and trainer's advice and build him up to that, which is what he would be doing in spring training. You know, this is basically his spring training right now. Yeah. And that's like, you made a good point there. You you really can't like, you can't simulate standing in the outfield and randomly sprinting, you know, yeah. over a three hour period and then going and hitting, maybe you hit a double, maybe you pop out, but it, you know, you just, first of all, it'd just be exhausting for a guy to do that program to, yeah. to try to simulate it. The yeah. only way to do it's really to throw him out there and just have him play and get used to it. So I think that's, that's kind of been the plan the whole time and, and it's smart, but if he's, 
you know, if he's flying all over the place and doesn't seem to be showing any kind of soreness or having any hiccups, you know, they get their reports on the trainer. He tells them how he's feeling. Yeah. If there's nothing going on and the guy seems ready, you know, I don't, I don't see what the difference is if he's doing that and playing like that in the minors versus big leagues. Yeah. And I think that's why he's going to be coming back like two weeks earlier than they initially Mm -hmm. anticipated. So, um, but you know, when people ask why he's not doing this in the big leagues, well, I mean, it's just like spring training when it's like, we have all the regulars, they don't play nine innings the first game. They don't play nine innings until the end. Actually, they, they really ease them into that. The big guys don't play. They play one game, like three at bats, then they don't yeah. play the next day. Then they play three at bats, you know, and they slowly work into it. So, yep. and just because a guy steals a base in his first game in spring training, you don't say, well, let's start the season. You know, he's ready. They work up to it. So, and he's yeah. got to remember he's facing triple A pitching right now, which is yep. guys who either aren't ready for the big leagues or journeymen who weren't good enough to stay in the big leagues. Yep. Or, you know, he's not facing the guys he's going to be facing when he, when he steps in there against the Mets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, especially with the starters they've got right now. And they haven't even had DeGrom. And the other guys are pitching great. Yeah. Uh, you know, just luckily with him, he's got so much bad speed and he's so talented. There's yeah, there's not really a pitcher you could throw at him that's right. going to phase him. But he it, it does help you get your feet under you to face some lesser competition and, and you know, see pitches from guys that aren't throwing 104, you know. And get your timing, um, you know, and everything. Yeah. In the outfield. It, you know, you can power shag in the outfield before games, but it's different taking a bat, ball off the bat in games. So they just want him to do a lot, you know, yep. and be ready so that you don't have to work towards that. Once he gets here, he's ready to f- go full bore. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I get a lot of com- questions on, and we've gotten these now for two weeks on Twitter, is why he's playing in minor leagues when he could be doing this up here because the brace could use him. Well, I would just ask people to say to yourself, because this obviously isn't served by service time or anything like that. The Braves have nothing to gain by having him yeah. down there as far as that's concerned. So ask yourself, do the Braves team officials not have a hell of a lot more vested in this and ha- and on the line in this than you or I or the fans do? Yes, they do. So there, it's not like it's a conspiracy. You know, They want him to be here as soon as he can help the team play. And if they thought that was yesterday, he'd be here. There is absolutely no reason why they would be putting him down there as anything. But, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, they have I mean, a lot more on the line than we, than we do. Yeah, well, you you got it's a controlled environment, right? If if right. you have to yank him from a game or give him two days off, it, it, you know I'm not going to say the minor league season doesn't matter, but it's for development. It's mm-hmm. you know winning the. PCL or, you know, the, the Gwinnett winning a championship doesn't really serve the organization. I mean, it's a cool, you know, you give the guys the pat on the back. But when you have to start taking guys out of your big league lineup or giving extra days off right. to guys in your big league lineup, you only have so many roster spots. And once you take them off the 60 day, somebody's got to come off the 40 man, right? Right. So you you're you're exactly. you need that spot too to, to be able to manipulate and use. And so you've just you got to put him through the test and make sure all right, he's ready. We're taking him off the six today. We're activating him and he's playing every day because you can't you can't mess around like that with like you can with a triple A lineup. And he hadn't played nine innings until yesterday, until Sunday's right. game. So you can't be playing guys six innings. And right. And 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 resting them every other day. So I know you a lot of people would say he's so good that it's worth having him, even if he's not playing every day. Well, you can't do that. You can't go shorthanded. I know that you ended up doing that with Duvall when you had a family emergency. And right, you know, you go shorthanded when you have to, but you don't plan on that. You can't say Acuna's so good that we're gonna have him here to play six innings, then nine innings, then rest the day. So anyway. I know he's so good too, but you also can't have him come up and ha- not having faced elite pitching, you know, because Triple A's as close as you're going to get, but you can't throw him in rookie ball and say he's raking there. Right. Then have him come up to the big leagues and the game's a little fast for him because he's had a year off yeah. and he's hitting a buck 10. You yeah. know, you want to make sure he's he's back to normal and ready and seen good pitching. So, I mean, it's not like it's this isn't wasted time. You know, it's yeah. it's something you just have to go through with a guy. So anyway, that's the uh, that's the one really good, uh, really good thing that the Braves have to look forward to is that's now we can now see the light at the end of the tunnel in this one, and it's not a train bearing down on them. They're seven and ten, but they got Acuna coming back, and they're yeah they're five games behind the Mets, but you can make that up in a hurry, and you know it's not any time to panic yet, and and once he gets here, it does change this team a lot, and also I'm not expecting Dansby Duvall. 
Rosario uh, to continue struggling like they have. But no. one of those guys in the outfield between that mix of Alex Dickerson, Rosario, Azuna is supposed to move to the DH spot. But one of those guys is, got, is not going to be playing, obviously. You're going to have a mix now for two spots instead of – well, for one spot instead of for two spots. So uh, that it's going to be huge adding him to the lineup and moving everybody else down because Alvis has done a good job in the power in the leadoff spot as far as power. But to move him down the order where he can get some RBIs, hitting some of those home runs with runners on base, have Acuna at the top, the lineup just changes dramatically when he's added at the top. Now, and it's a lot more stress on the guys hitting 185 when it's a 1-0 game. You know, it's – yeah. If the rest of your offense puts up a six spot and you come up batting 185, you don't have to get a hit here. You know, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but when every guy's struggling, your, your offense as a whole is struggling, you know, to put up runs, that's more pressure on every single guy. So you compound that with your 185 batting average. It's, yeah. it's a lot harder to get out of when you don't have that front, you know, part of the lineup putting up some big runs. The other thing, the other uh, thing that the, the Braves have, have the most encouraging development of this early season because there have been several, obviously, Matt Olson, the way he's played, um, what you've got from Austin Riley coming off that la- that breakout season he had last year. He's looked like that same guy this year, basically sitting 300 with power, huge OB, uh, OPS. Um, what you've gotten from a couple of young, young pitchers uh, has been really encouraging. But I think the biggest thing so far, has been the transformation, the yep. coming out of Kyle Wright, because yep. this guy has been, we've talked about him. And I tell you, this is, this goes back to what we've talked about. It's a good thing. We're not making the decisions because you said no. you would have traded everybody. I would have gotten rid of Kyle Wright. I yeah. will admit that. And I would be so wrong right now because it took more. It took longer than that they anticipated longer than anybody hoped, but this guy now looks like the number five pick overall in the draft in 2017. Yep. He looks like an absolute stud, an ace now. He's pitching terrific in his three starts. It's not one or two. No. It's three really good starts, and he's getting better. I mean, he just – to me, it doesn't look anything fluky. He's just dealing. And the stuff's uh, there's no been smoke there. and mirrors. <laughs> You've always talked about his stuff. Even when he was struggling, yeah. you talked about how great his stuff was. He's put he, it all he, together now. I feel like in past years, you could just see that lack of confidence, you know, kind of pitching a little timid, nibbling around the zone. And you could see it in his body language, too. Um, but I don't know if somebody talked to him or he just said, you know, screw it. I'm <laughs> I'm going down in flames. But the way he's thrown the ball this year has been extremely aggressive. You know, he's not yeah. afraid of contact. And by not being afraid of contact, all his pitches are nastier. They're in the zone and he's getting more swings and misses. Because he's just challenging hitters. You know, I haven't, if you watch the way he's finishing pitches, the direction of his body, yeah, and just like the, you know, the viciousness of, of the, the, the last, you know, 5% of his delivery when he releases the ball and just whips through. Yeah. It's, I don't remember him throwing the ball like that last year, but hitters feel that. Well, just so happens I'm writing a story on him later today that should be posted tonight. And it's going to talk about all that stuff you just mentioned. The, move, the transformations that he made, the, the work he did in the offseason on his delivery, the decision last year, late in the year, to go with a curve back to the curveball, which was so good for him in college and early minors. But he worked away, to, he worked away from it towards the slider because the analytics said, you know, slider and fastballs up in the zone is what you want to do. He got away from using that curveball. He's back using it now as his primary, as his best pitch. And the direction you're talking about Stan, he said he he said he could take two. They got a guy showed him. He worked with this this uh, famous uh, guy that works with on delivery and foot and foot placement and all that and athletic movement of pitchers in the off season. A guy named Ben Brewster. Okay, uh, he worked on with him in Nashville a lot in the off season, and with the guys up at up at uh, Vandy. And he he said you could put a side by side picture of him just a still shot and you wouldn't believe it's even the same guy from like his early, yeah. like at Vandy and then where he at his worst, he said, it didn't even look like the same guy. And then obviously the film of that, the video even emphasized that even more, but he was just out of sync and yep. how he was coming off the mound and how he wasn't using the mound and was basically turning it into flat ground pitching, you know? Yep. So he's got all that work and then going back to the curveball And like you said, pitching, Going at guys, trusting his stuff completely. All this, all the cliches. He's actually doing it, 
and he's just getting the results. He's going out there and throwing, you know, the fastball up in the zone. Guys just can't catch yeah. up to it when they've also got to be aware of that nasty sinker and that curveball. Yep. That he's throwing both of them great. And he's also well, got the yeah. change too in his back pocket. He's got that he, change up. He, he's got everything's good, but you know, maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's why he's able to finish with all that confidence and aggressiveness is because his stuff has gotten better. I mean, you know, this is it, the, the two feet off each other. So if you just go out there throwing shit salad yeah, <laughs> right down the middle, it's like, I got big balls yeah. and I'm challenging everybody. Right. You know, that's not enough to just have balls and be going after guys. Your stuff has to be able to play. But I think with Kyle the whole time, you've been able to tell he has the stuff. Yeah. And, and he hasn't just hasn't pitched with that confidence and, and aggressiveness that you're seeing out of him this year. But it, you know, it can be just a little, and that's why it's so hard to analyze pitchers, but it can be just a little change in direction, gets you mm -hmm. a little more extension, gets you a little more life on your ball. And all of a sudden you do make a mistake and you throw a fastball right down the dick, but it beats the hitter to the spot and you get a foul ball. Yeah. Now your confidence just creeps up a little bit. You're going to yeah. make a better pitch. And, and keep keep challenging hitters. But when you are pulling off it, you know, like we've seen when Freed gets into a slump, he kind of pulls off and pushes it. Yeah. The hitter sees it for that extra second, and then they shit all over it. And then you start questioning your stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, all that feeds off each other, but there's two different ways to go. So if he put in that work and his stuff is better now, and he starts challenging guys in spring training, and he's yeah. not getting hurt, he's just going to get more and more confident and more and more aggressive and with the stuff he has, you know, I mean, you're seeing it all come together. And th this is why, you know, teams don't give up on guys because once it clicks, yeah, they can turn into who he's turned into in, in a matter of a month. Yeah, he's pitching like a top of the rotation starter right now. I mean, he's – Yeah. I, I, I was looking at it today. Him and Carlos Rodon of the Giants have been arguably the best two starting pitchers in the National League so far. Statistically, very several of the analytics and statistics say the best two. Um. And I think a lot of people might have expected that from Rodon. I mean, he's nasty. He yep. went over the Giants, but nobody expected that from Kyle Wright, including Kyle Wright, even though he knew when he pitched in a World Series and had that appearance and using all the stuff we're talking about, he knew he was going in the right direction. And to keep building off that in the offseason, he felt confident coming in, and he's done it. But each of these guys, man, their stats are almost identical. Him and Rodon are each 2-0 and with a 106 ERA and three starts. Each has 17 innings. Wright has a slightly better whip. 076 whip to Rodon's 082. Rodon leads the NL with 29 strikeouts, 17 innings. Wright is second in the league in strikeouts with 26, also 17 innings. Rodon's walked six. Wright has two walks. Yep. The guy's got 26 strikeouts and two walks and a 180 opponent's batting average. I wouldn't have taken that bet. You know, just just what you've seen from them in in the past. You know, the the nibbling stuff. But that's that's what I'm talking about. If you once you start getting away with pitches in the zone, yeah, and you know your stuff's there, yeah, you stop being timid and you start challenging guys. And it's it's just crazy how it it just kind of the snowball effect, the confidence and aggression, and you watch a pitcher turn into what he's turning into. And his last two starts, which were at San Diego against a damn good lineup out there in a packed yep. house, and Friday against the Marlins, we've got some. I mean. Jazz Chisholm, we talked about him the last one. He lived up to my what my billing. He's one of the most exciting young players in the game. And they got a couple of other hitters too, like Solaire. But against in those two starts, Wright has 20 strikeouts and one walk in 11 innings. Dude, that is sheer dominance. Yeah. I mean, that is that's that's, yeah. that's what you every bit what you had hoped at the best possible that you would hope Freed might be this year, you know? Yep. So while Freed and 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 uh, Charlie have struggled a little bit in a couple starts, and Freed was awesome in one of his, Kyle has picked up the slack and run with it. And Ian Anderson struggled too early too, and he's had one good start. So when those guys get going, you should have four guys there in your rotation now that you can really put up against just about anybody's. Yep. Yeah, and even you know Elder, he's just got to right. get away from walking guys. But yeah. That's kind of feeds into what I'm saying is you, you know his debut. He didn't get hit hard, right? And he, he just kept firing strikes, firing strikes, firing strikes. Then his arm got a little tired, and Juan Soto hits a ball seven million feet. Yeah. And how many walks has he had since that moment? Yeah. Because it's like, oh shit, I can get hit up here. Yeah. You know, so it's it's kind of like he's gone the other direction where he's right. learning. All right, if I make a mistake to these big league hitters, it could go five hundred yeah. feet. 
you know, no walks in that first start, 11 yep. walks in nine innings in his last two starts after back to back homers. And he almost got out of all those jams yesterday, got out of two bases loaded jams yesterday, didn't run in trouble till the last two batters he faced finally, but he kept, it just kept getting in trouble with the walks and finally yep. bit him in the ass. But, um, but yeah, we see we see why why they like him so much, and that potential is obviously there to be a really good fifth starter. Well, to have year. that many walks and back to back starts, and not yeah, not have them either one of them turn into a complete blow up, you and know, not have a double digit ERA. <laughs> yeah, it's it's impressive in its own you know way. I mean, yeah. you don't want to keep doing it, but it's right. impressive to be able to battle through that. Um, uh, I think we have some ads to read here. Am I, am I- all right, Cam. Yep, you are correct. Uh, Omaha Steaks, proud sponsor of them. They have hooked us up 50% off your order plus 12 free steak burgers when you go to omahasteaks.com. Use our promo code 755-REAL. That's 755-R-E-A-L. If you go to omahasteaks.com, there's a little search bar at the top. You just put that code in, and they will be sure to hook you up. Uh, we've been kind of talking behind the scenes about the Celtics and the Nets, and we're kind of – David's a – Celtics fan and we've been rooting for them and we kind of spoke tongue in cheek last time about how the Nets were going to be eating the Omaha steak burger soon uh, because the barbecue's going to be fired up they're going to be hitting their off season soon and uh, I guess they didn't understand that we were just joking because the sweep is for real like it's going to happen 3-0 right now Ben Simmons sitting out so make sure you get along with the Nets, I guess, and get your 12 free steak burgers at 50% off your deal from omahasteaks.com. Use the promo code 755REAL. And for some reason, you don't like the burgers, don't like the steak, poultry, whatever, because they have a giant selection to choose from. You get your money back 100%. They have 100% money back guarantee. No reason you should dislike it. David fired up his grill, made the fillets recently. Love them. So make sure you get on board with us. OmahaStakes.com, promo code 755-REAL. Also, make sure to check out LinkedIn.com slash real. You can post your first job for free. Let's do the campaign of help Cam find a new job. I get all this crap behind the scenes and in the show from David. Help me land a new gig. It's the number one rated business online website for small businesses to find new candidates. Make sure you join the 40 million plus individuals that are looking for jobs at linkedin.com you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash real help me get a new job so i don't receive crap from david anymore and also Please help him get a new job uh, when intimacy arrives make sure you check out roman 15 dollars off your first month of treatment when you're prescribed that is get roman.com slash seven five five that's get roman.com slash intimacy seven arrives, five baby. five yes when intimacy you gotta be ready arrives you, you gotta, gotta be ready, be ready. Roman's the only way to do it. That's the only way you can be ready. When if you're not ready. You're not I mean, Roman ready. I you mean, don't yeah, know. what are you doing? First impression is kind of the only impression with a lot of people, right? Yeah, they're just kind of like Ben Simmons just sitting on the bench. Like, what are you doing? Exactly. Exactly. Roman would not have Ben Simmons as a as an endorse, endorsee. Because he just is not ready, ever. <laughs> what a joke ben simmons his whole career is going to be a joke in the, in retrospect uh yeah i don't have anything to contribute on that i mean my back hurt plenty still not pitched <laughs> <laughs> you gutted it out didn't you you went out there and pitched in playoffs shot it up shoot me up with something <laughs> whatever it takes shoot me up with something i won't even ask you know <laughs> Tore it all or some kind of painkiller. Let's let's go play. Let's so you playoffs. put in a hard workout, man. Getting ready for that return. Yeah. <laughs> it's a couple <laughs> fadeaways. Um, so anyway, we talked a little bit about Kyle. Uh, I just I'm gonna do that story later today. I hope you guys will read it because he really I thought this guy's really well spoken and I thought he explained it in depth. Um, so I'm gonna get into what Cause you know, this has been a struggle for this guy for four years, man. I asked him, I said, yeah. has this been tough? Because if I was in his shoes, I would have got depressed, man, because you, you know, you so much expectations heaped upon you you make your debut the year after you're drafted in a matter of months after you're drafted. And, uh, you know, you show f- so many signs here and there flashes of brilliance, but then, so many other times where you just look like you got no hope, like mentally you can't hold it together when something goes wrong. 
So he's had a lot of people bail on him and, and, you know, he's been ripped to shreds in the age of social media in the old days. It wouldn't have been a big deal for him to take this much long to get here. But, you know, this, in this day and age of, you know, get rid of this guy, there, there's been a lot of people that have bailed on him. And well, you know, I think it's always been get rid of this guy, but those people just didn't have a voice. <laughs> you know, Right. It's the it's social media lets the, the worst people speak, you know, and that's, that's part of why no athlete should have it. Yeah. Um, when I asked him about, you know, the, I said, did you consciously make that move from the slider back to the curveball? Because Dansby, I talked to Dansby and Dansby said he always had a great curveball, you know, because as a fellow Vanderbilt guy, he followed his yeah. whole career, obviously. And uh, and and Kyle said, so like in college, that was my pitch, the curveball. I said, I was mostly fastball, curveball, and that was pretty much it. I would mix in an occasional change up and cutter. Early in pro ball, like my first year, I was still mostly curveball. And then kind of at the same time was when analytics really started to take over with the fastballs up, the hard slot sliders down. So I, he said, so I had my cutter. It was a solid, it was a good pitch. And I was having a lot of success with it, but it just wasn't always the most consistent pitch. But I kind of stuck with using that for really kind of the rest of 2018, 19, and even some of 2020. And then when I first started to really lock in and say my curveballs, the pitch, my pitch was in 2020, when I got an option down the first time, I struggled the first couple of games there. When I got an option, that was when I sat down with our pitching coordinator and our assistant GM. And that's kind of when they said, like, you've got a great two seamer and a really good curveball. You need to use it more. Yeah. So that's when he started to use those pitches more. And I asked him, does the curveball complement the four seamer and the sinker better than the slider does? And he said, I think it's just an overall a better pitch. Honestly, I'm really comfortable with it because it's like the same grip and the same pitch I've thrown since high school. And it was my pitch in college talking about the curveball. So I think just kind of the fact that I can kind of change the shape and change the speed of it, it complements itself, if you will, right? because I can use it in different ways. But with that being said, I do think the fact that I have that hard two seamer going in and my curveball said, my curveball is a little more sweepier. So it kind of plays off it a little better. Yeah. But at the same time, if I shoot a four seamer up, I can kind of try to tilt the shape a little bit and get the curveball going down more. So yeah, definitely it complements both better. Hey, we can all think of that, but it, you know, not a lot of guys can do that. Where where they're right. saying, you know, what he's saying basically is when he throws a straight four seam and it and it seems to ride upward, he's gonna tilt the 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 curveball so it breaks more downward. Uh -huh. But when he throws a two seam and it runs sideways. He's going to try to mimic that break with his curveball the other direction. I mean, and that's pitching. Right. It's just you, not a lot of guys can can execute that. You know, right. I could dream it up or do it on MLB the show, but I was never able to to manipulate a changeup or a certain pitch in a way that maybe this is the right pitch, but I can't make it. Yeah. It, it's cool to hear him say that he can actually do that, and you know, that's maybe he couldn't do that with his slider and maybe a slider had one tilt. It was one pitch. He was never comfortable with it, but now he's got back to his curveball. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also the same thing of like having this idea of this might work. And this is what I want to do here and being able to execute it with a specific grip. It mm -hmm. gives you way more confidence when you throw it. If you're stuck and you're like, this is my stupid slider. That's not my best pitch. And that's what the analytics say I'm supposed to throw. You're not throwing that pitch with confidence right. either. Right. And I, and I asked him about, I said, so you kind of got back to being yourself, really? And he said, yeah. yeah, exactly. He said, that's kind of what that reset button was like last year. He's talking about spending a whole, whole, almost the entire season in AAA, which he said in retrospect, yeah, it sucked being down there, but it was the best thing that could have happened to him because he was pitching every five days and he was working with these guys on his mechanics and that pitch and getting back to his curveball. And if he'd have been here, he's working trying to survive. So he's not you working on fail. that curveball, yep. you know? Yeah. So like you've talked about, you know, some guys like a change of pace going to a bad team where they're going to keep him in the rotation at the major league level, whether they screw up or not, or, you know, suck or not. Well, he was, he got that in effect by going to triple a last year. Didn't have to worry about whether he stunk or something. So he got it's his confidence huge. back. And when they brought him up to pitch in the world series, he had that confidence back and that curveball going. So, well, that's, you know, that's kind of what happened to me toward the end of my career was, I knew I needed to get back to the four seam fastball. Uh huh. But if you don't use a pitch, you lose it. So I try to demo this four seam that I yeah. wanted to throw. And it's yeah. like, that thing sucks. You know, we, we have to get outs today. Right now, your sinker is your best pitch. You know, I mean, the best thing I could have done in my career 
was after the Braves released me, just recreate myself, go down and pitch and throw four seams repeatedly until yeah. I found that four seamer again and, you know, worked on it and made it a good pitch. And if you don't use the pitch, like you kind of lose that, that life on it. So if right, he's not right. throwing his curveball, he might have said to a coach, hey, I think yeah. I need to throw my curveball again. He's like, well, why don't you throw some today? Well, he hasn't, he hasn't lived off it in a year and he goes and throws horse shit curveballs and gets raked. You know, you can have that failure in double A or triple A and be like, you know, what about the good ones I threw and build off of those? But when you're making a major league start and right. you're like, I want to mix in a curveball today, they're like, fuck you. You yeah. <laughs> we need you throwing your best shit today, right yeah. now. We can't have you go out and experiment. We're trying to make the playoffs. So yeah. I mean that's that's when going down to the minor leagues can really benefit a guy. And it, and it sounds like it did. Absolutely. Um and just just the last thing and again there's gonna be a lot of this stuff in the story i'm gonna write about him today but i said how rough has it been the last four years kind of going back and forth you know having a good game but then three bad ones getting sent down all that i oh. said whether i said were there ever times where you started doubting yourself at all and he said oh 100 <laughs> percent." he was honest a lot of guys wouldn't admit Every that time he, i woke up <laughs> he said yeah there were definitely times where there's that's kind of what it was i feel like i had lost confidence he said it was really my mechanical leading to my mental. So in 2020, kind of when I got first got option, I started working with Zach Sorensen, who's the mental performance coach for the Braves. And he helped me a ton that year. And honestly, that year when I started pitching well was really all honestly just mental capacity, all my routines. But my mechanics still weren't where I wanted them to be. And I didn't realize that because I was having some success. Just like I said, with the routines, that was a big piece for me in 2020. I started getting back to doing all those things just having my routines, knowing what I'm starting to get out of whack and how to get back into it, using using the uh, the reset, all that stuff. Um, so when he when he did applied the mechanical part of it last year and kind of put it all together with the curveball and all that, he had figured out the mental part of it. It just kind of all came together. And now when he gets out of whack, he knows how to get back in rather than you know kind of losing his mind for a while. Well, and you can get out. You can afford to get out of whack when you're confident. Yeah. You know, you you can't afford to to not be confident and be out of whack. Like you're giving up ten. You know, but once you build that confidence, now if if he runs into a little spurt this year where his mechanics are all jacked up and he doesn't feel good, yeah, he might not even know he's off until he gets hit a little bit. But he'll still have the confidence to grind through that inning and and, and get his way through it. And then he can look at it after the game and and analyze it and be like, "Here's what I was doing wrong. All right, I see this." But when you're not confident. And you show up out of whack that day. Yeah. You know, that's why you have to at least have one of them. Like you either got to have the stuff or the confidence. But when you show up out of whack, yeah, and your stuff sucks and you're not confident and you're nibbling, you're just begging to give up a 10 spot. Yeah, he said that's what he said. He said, uh, uh, getting that part into it helped me a lot. And I didn't worry so much about results. Before I was like, I have to pitch well, I have to do this. Obviously, you yep. need results. But whenever you're just stuck on trying to always get results, you're not going to have much success because you're worried about all the wrong things. Yep. So the Sorensen, the mental health, mental performance coach, he kind of helped me switch to, you know, the whole control what you can control thing. And that's what I can do on the mound and executing the pitch. And then once the ball leaves your hand, there's nothing you can do. Yep. So that was a big part for me. And, and then being able to pair all that with what I'm doing mechanically now. So I feel I'm, I'm back to being myself. Well, he looks like it. Yeah. So <laughs> I did ask him, how do you do ignore all the critics and all that? And he said, delete Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> I said, did, a, you do, he said, did you do that? And he goes, well, no, I just shut them off for a while. Yeah. Yeah. He said, even I, now, even now that he's good, he avoids going on there and get and seeing everybody talk the opposite about him. Well, because then, you know, if you get addicted to checking out all the yeah. good shit people are saying when you're good, then you're going to yeah. suck. You're going to be like, well, I wonder if they still like me now. And you're going to log on and it's going to be the worst fucking guy on earth. Yeah. He's going to say this piece of shit was a fluke the whole time. And you just, you know, you don't need that stuff bouncing around in your head. I tell all the young guys that, you know, I, I read the papers one year and it was 2008 when I was with Seattle. I gave up like 20 runs because I, I was on the mound thinking about what this one beat writer had said about me the night before. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck, Baker's going to write this if I give up a hit here. How about that? I mean, <laughs> that's brutal, man. So I hope nobody ever went to the mountain thinking about anything I wrote about them. They probably, I mean, you know, I mean, I was being a bitch at the time, but I, you, this should never happen. But I just remember thinking like, 
oh shit, this is what the guy said I was gonna yeah. do if you know yeah. if I face this lineup or something yeah. like that, right? Right, and right. Remember jogging to back up home plate and this beat writer's on my mind. And but he also he also he's a really bright guy, and he also said because there's some stuff out there, and he goes, and I understand people's frustration. They love the Braves and they want us to be good. So it's one of those things where you understand why people are frustrated. But as a human being, you don't want to see that. You don't want to read nope. that. Because, Never. again, that kind of goes into the mental a little bit. So you take a break from that stuff. You really don't you don't really don't see much of it. And I feel like that definitely helped to just kind of, you know, go be myself. Yep. And that's I mean, for me, I, I, I checked out on that and never read a thing again. And people don't believe you when you say that. Yeah. But that moment for me was rock bottom of backing up home plate and the beat writers on my mind. <laughs> I've never right, right. reading shit anybody says about me again, and I didn't, and it it went pretty well after that. Hey, uh, another thing, Ozzy Albies is tied with Byron Buxton, the Twins, and Colorado CJ Cron for the MLB home run lead with six. Buxton has done it in ten games. He missed time with a knee thing. I said after watching him this a few times this spring, if you recall, I said if he plays 145, 150 games. He can win AO MVP, even with Shohei and Trout. This guy is that good. Georgia yeah. native. When he's healthy, Buxton might seriously be the best player in baseball. That's what Baldelli said is he's the best player on earth right now. And I he mean, he's so good. He's just never been healthy. Right. But, and it's on both sides of the ball. He's yeah. as good defensively as, as he is at the plate. Yep. Phenomenal. Some guys talent. just get bit with that bug. And, you know, it's like, you want to question their toughness and then they break a bone and it's like, they just can't catch a break as far as health goes, but you could see what they'd be if they were healthy. Right. Five of Crohn's six homers, by the way, have come at Coors field. He's hitting 350 with a 1172 OPS and 10 games there. He's hit 150 with a 590 OPS and five road games. He's not helping much for the, to, to dispel the, the uh, Coors field. No effect. <laughs> Uh, also worth noting, Albies and Buxton have both hit all of their home runs while batting leadoff. It's a, kind of another reminder that how radically different the leadoff position is than back in the day. I mean, with the exception of guys, of some guys like Ricky Henderson, who had serious pop, that was primarily a spot where you just put the burners with good averages yep. and decent OBPs who could steal your bases and cause havoc and be pests on the bases. But you didn't have a lot of power hitters in leadoff, and you do now. I'd like to see a team try it. You know, I'd like to see a team try just – like I remember facing the Angels had Reggie Willits and uh, Chone Figgins that yeah. were both hitting at the time at the top of their lineup, and they were in front of uh, Garrett Anderson and, and Vladimir Guerrero. Right. It was like you knew you had to get those guys out. You know, it put so much pressure on you because if you didn't, then you face the thump. You know, I mean, a solo shot I wouldn't scare me as much as a pitcher – I mean, it kind of sucks to start the game off that right. way, but I think, you know, I think just as a whole, there's, there's room for speed contact guys to kind of reemerge with all the shifting and all the yeah. stuff going on. But I mean, if you put Acuna at the leadoff spot, he has all that. Right. He has all <laughs> you know, that. Why wouldn't you? He's kind of like Ricky. He's got speed yeah. and power. I mean, he's not going to steal yeah. bases like that because the game's changed and they're not having him steal every time he yeah. gets on base, but he has that kind of speed and power like Buxton does. I mean, Buxton's like a bigger version of Ricky. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a the ball he hit yesterday, that walk on. Oh my God. 467. And then the opposite field earlier in the game. That was almost more impressive. Oh my God. Line drive oppo, man. Yeah. Beast. And cold in Minnesota and the ball doesn't fly. Yep. You know, I mean, he's he's just a freak athlete. Um Buxton is hitting 351 with a 415 OBP and are you ready for this? 946 slugging percentage in 10 games. Jesus. <laughs> Acuna steps right back in the leadoff spot, by the way, for those wondering. There's not going to be a transition with him no. in lower in the order and working up to leadoff because Ozzy's had some power there. As great as Ozzy's power has been there, it's been Acuna power in the leadoff spot. Ozzy's hitting 259 with a 323 OBP, which that's not ideal for, obviously, for the leadoff guy. So you'll add, you'll have the same power there with Acuna, but you're going to have a higher average in OBP, obviously. Um, by the way, speaking of leadoff, have you seen who the Pirates have had hitting leadoff lately? Daniel no. Vogelbach. 
the dude from the Brewers who came up a couple of years ago with the Brewers and had the big little stretch with the Brewers when he was really big for them. He's All huge. Right. <laughs> He's six feet and listed at 270. The guy's got to be three bills, man. Yeah. He's, he's hitting 311 with three bombs and 936 OPS and 45 at bats this year. Can he move? I mean, I've never seen him run, but if he can, if Maryland. he's having good at bats, you know, yeah, whatever. He's got to be the largest leadoff man I've ever seen. I mean, in terms of just being a fat ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jason Hayward let off some, but he's just, he's just a big dude. He's not fat at all. This guy's oh, big. <laughs> That's him. I'm trying to think. A fat guy like that? I mean, no, I have not seen that. <laughs> no, but he's got some power, though. I remember oh, a ball over back hit. Yeah, he hit, hit, too. Yeah, he hit a ball at safe go into the third deck I'd never seen before. <laughs> he had, at, w- with the Brewers in 2020, four homers and a 987 OPS in 19 games. And then last year, they let him play a lot early, early and he plummeted 219, 719 OPS in 93 games. So that was it with the Brewers. So it's with the Pirates now, kind of just trying to restore his career. So far, so good. You know who else is back is Mike Trout. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I predicted a big year for him. Homer. I, I said this is the year he's going to stay healthy. I did predict that. I mean, I probably predicted that before, too. But I really thought this is the year that Trout stays healthy. You just watch. Because everybody's kind of moving on to Shohei and other guys now. And We might have picked him for AL MVP. I think you did. did. That little preview. I thought, I thought if he stayed healthy, he'd have a big year. He yeah. had two last night. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's Mike Trout. He's still yeah. I think Buxton's it's the only crazy guy. Crazy how quick you forget. Yeah, Buxton, yeah. you understand forgetting because he gets hurt so much. But yeah, Trout. I mean, I guess Trout's had a few injuries too. Maybe if yeah, quite a few. Maybe if Buxton comes back and or if Acuna comes back and he's immediately the old Acuna and he plays every day, you could put him in that category when he's at his best, no doubt. But right now, I'd say Buxton is the guy that can push Trout as the best overall player in the game. Yeah. Both yeah, sides of the ball. Riding motorcycles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a ways to go to put get in their category, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, for sure. Because they do everything. Soto, though, for me. Right, but Soto's Soto. not nearly the defensive player no, that Tom Buxton is. He's just he's okay. Not. He's just such a good hitter. Yeah. I love his swing. Yeah. And, you know, Soto, I think it's going to really – he's going to pay the price for not having any help around him because you're seeing yeah. it now. Look at the walks just piling up. Oh, you know, that would be the hitters meeting be- or the pitchers meeting before you face the Nationals is just yeah. that guy gets nothing. <laughs> you know, yeah. if it's two outs, nobody on and we're up by five, go ahead and pitch to him. But if he comes up and that bat matters at all, just get the guy behind him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's he's got Nelson Cruz behind him, but Nelson's hitting 177 and Nelson's pitchable. Juan Soto, I don't know how to pitch to. Yeah. That's the two. That, that's the only two in the order, really, though. Yeah. That you have to really worry about. Uh, by the way, the Reds had not won a game since beating the Braves two out of four. They had not won another game until this weekend. They finally broke through. They had lost like 10 in a row, 11 in a row. They are terrible, man. I, 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 when these teams do these teardown, I hope they lose 150 games. Yeah. Every team that does it. I don't feel any sympathy. For Votto's sake, he needs to go to, he needs to be on a decent team for the stretch drive. I don't know how much he's got left on that contract though, but man. That's that's a shame. His career is going to end in th- with that. Sorry, crew there. But uh, anyway, Braves are seven and ten, exactly the same record they had a year ago. By the way, is that weird or what? And they've and they're struggling in kind of the same ways. Last year rotation early on, the best Freed and Freed and uh, Charlie struggled early on. Bullpen struggled early on last year. Uh, hitting, they had several guys that weren't doing anything early last year including Riley. Remember, he didn't have an RBI or extra base hit for like 15 games. Freddie started slow last year. It's just, as Snit said when I asked him yesterday, he goes, it's eerily similar to last year. Yeah. Uh, difference being the Mets are, are really good. I mean, last year they were in first, but this year they're legitimately in first, and they're, they're a much tougher team. I, I don't see the Mets collapsing like they did last year, and they haven't gotten any from DeGrom yet, assuming he comes back sometime midseason. That rotation, man, they've got three guys in it right now that are pitching great. You add yeah. him and woo. Carrasco, McGill, Scherzer. If they're, if they're still like this at the All-Star break, I'll start getting scared. And Lindor, different player now, man. Yeah, but that's been a big change. 
back to Cleveland, back to Cleveland, Lindor. So anyway, all right, big week coming up for the Braves. They got a chance. Uh, you know, I, I I really thought that they would take two out of three, at least from the Marlins. They lost two out of three. Um, they need to they need to do something against the Cubs because the Cubs are not very good. They got three against the Cubs. They got a chance to really have a big week leading into Acuna's return because then they go to Texas. Texas is like five and ten. They play down there, and then you go to big. You know, no series in April May is huge, but you got a big series just to kind of test yourself early against the Mets. I know the Mets are going to view it as big to establish that they're the new Kings of the division and all that. And you got three, four games in three days up there, including a double header part of that weird schedule where they're making up those games that were lost that first week. So you got a scheduled double header on Tuesday. So four games in three days, you got a chance to really do something there. If you can go up there, you know, get on a roll before you go up there, get close that gap a little bit and just kind of feel better about yourself as uh, as May's get going, getting into gear. Yeah, I think, you know, you, pretty soon you're going to start getting more consistent starts out of the starters, too. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's been really convenient that Wright's done what he's done, but Ian, yeah. you know, Max, Charlie haven't quite been – Max's last start was sick. Yeah. But, you know, they haven't they haven't done what you expect them to do. But you get all you, – if you get all four starters rolling. Right. And you, Charlie's stuff is still almost identical yeah. to me. I don't see that, that's what doesn't stuff. scare me about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, Ian, he had a rough start and a good one, but – his stuff's still there. You know, I yeah. mean, it's and he's always a slow starter. Charlie's stuff's there. Max stuff's there. Kyle's never looked better. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't worry too much about this team. And I don't think, you know, the guys in the bullpen forgot how to pitch. You know, I'm not worried about really Mentor. He's had some bad out, a couple of bad outings. McHugh's had a couple of bad outings. Uh, Matzik's look good. Jensen, Jensen's looked great. Uh, yep. since he gave up a couple of bloops in the, in the first game, but he's been pretty much perfect since then. Um, I, I think the bullpen's going to be fine. Oh, days look good. Yeah. Uh, no, bullpen's fine. Yeah. But, you know, just I, I know nobody wants to hear that comparisons to last year, but it, they really did struggle it's in the all the same shit. ways early last year. <laughs> and then they just got rolling and, you know, and they got a GM and they got some money that they're not going to sit on their hands. If they do need to make some moves at midseason, they will. If it comes to that. But you're about, yeah. to, you're about to add one of the five best players in baseball to your lineup. Remember yeah. that. So. Yep. That, that's pretty big. All I'm right. I'm not worried. All right. 755 is real. We'll do this again Wednesday. We're going to have one of those uh, real, one of those rooms. So you guys be prepared to talk live on the air. And be yeah, nice. Wait. Be nice or else we'll, we'll stop the call and you'll be banished forever from our <laughs> airways. <laughs> All right. That's it. 755 is real. We're out. All right.